Hello, welcome to The Naked Scientist with me, Chris Smith, and also with Kat Arney. And this week we're broadcasting from a very big tent on Parker's Peace, which is in the middle of the city of Cambridge as part of Cambridge's Big Weekend. Part of the reason we're here is to support Make It Digital. This is a BBC initiative taking place across the UK to shine a light on the world of digital creativity, including computer coding and programming, to building and making things. Is learning to code now as important as learning to read and write was historically? Will big data change the face of our health service? And what kind of information are you giving away online? Plus, we'll be learning how coding is the newest business in the music scene, and we'll be hearing about the dangers of why fishing. The Naked Scientist podcast is powered by UKfast.co.uk. Computers, mobile phones, even calculators, none of these would be possible without coding. But what actually is coding, and is it really a problem that so few of us know how to do it? Well, it certainly is. Because according to industry figures, in the next five years, the UK faces a skill shortage of some 1.4 million digital professionals. In other words, these are people trained in how to do computer programming. And someone who's trying to change this is Eben Upton, who's the founder of the Raspberry Pi Foundation and is with us. Hello, Eben. What are you trying to change here? What's your approach? So we're trying to get a new generation of children interested in uh, programming computers in the same way we were in the 1980s. Between the mid-1990s and uh, about 2005, we saw a collapse in the number of people applying to study computer science at the university here in Cambridge. It's really been mirrored across the entire university sector in the UK. It's a big threat to, I guess, the future, our future economic competitiveness in the UK. Why did you see that collapse? We have a hypothesis, and that's that the disappearance of machines like the BBC microcomputer, the Sinclair Spectrum in the 1980s, as those machines disappeared and they were replaced by games consoles and the, uh, the PC, machines which are either less programmable or just don't encourage you to program in the same way. About 10 years after those machines went away, the uh, flow of young people who'd been trained on them started to dry up. Indeed, because we saw this big bubble of people who were born with the BBC come along. I was, I was one of them. I remember coming to Cambridge to buy my BBC Model B Plus microcomputer here in Cambridge in 1984. I was a bit of a latecomer to the game, I understand, because it had been out a little while by then. But this really was a game changer because it brought within reach of your average home user the power of a modern computer. Yeah, so it provided a computer that you could, sure, you could use it to do your schoolwork on, you could use it to play computer games on, and that's why many people bought them. But the, the thing they all had in common is you turn them on, they go beep, and they give you a programming prompt. They give you, you know, the, the, the very first thing you could do with one of those machines is to start coding. What motivated you to actually start Raspberry Pi and, and to do it the way you've done it? I think there's something about a piece of hardware as opposed to just a, a software platform. A lot of people very early on with Raspberry Pi said, why don't you just create a, you know, an application you could run on a PC? The nice thing about a piece of hardware, particularly a piece of hardware that a child owns, is they, become, they can become very, very attached to it. I think the signs are very promising. There has been a massive upswing in interest. But yeah, I think it's probably going to be another five or six years before we really know for sure whether that hypothesis is correct. Because you're going to see this sort of lag effect to see if you've captured this next generation of people and then turn them into computer programmers. I think it's amazing, though. I mean, let's just describe for people what a Raspberry Pi is. What is it? Uh, it's a little credit card-sized uh, computer. It's a little credit card-sized uh, circuit board. By default, it doesn't even come with a case. But you plug it into your television. Uh, you plug a mouse and a keyboard into it, and it's a PC. You can use it to watch video. You can use it to surf the web. Full-featured machine. But what we do is we bundle it with every programming language that we think you need to go from knowing nothing about computers to being a professional computer programmer. I have to be honest, because out of intrigue, having had you on our program, I went and got one. Thank you. I, I want, well, thank <laughs> But it's 23 quid. I mean, that was part of the motivation. Who could ever dream of owning a computer that would cost you 23 quid? I mean, it's an incredible value for money, really. What you're talking about there is our expensive, that's our deluxe model. We actually have a £16 model as well. So it's really about trying to bring it within that. Uh, for us, kind of the benchmark, I guess, was a school textbook. We know that uh, you can ask children to buy their textbooks for school. Most families can afford it. The families who can't afford it, you can afford to subsidise it. So it was really getting it into that kind of end Envelope was really the driving force behind the design of the hardware. I know it works though, Evan, because having bought one myself, I then felt compelled to do something with it. And I immediately, within six months, learned two new programming languages. So there's the evidence, you know, for me it works. But then yesterday, I watched my daughter, who I've been 
encouraging to do this. SSH into using a terminal window, into a Raspberry Pi on a Wi-Fi network at home, and then actually begin to modify a program that I'd written. And, and she actually had this little array of things, and she could, she could make it print an animal's name so, as many times as she chose, and that kind of thing. And I think, this is fantastic. You've got someone who's eight actually speaking computer language. Yeah, there's something wonderful about there's something wonderful about the enthusiasm for it. There was always that kind of the other hypothesis, the kind of gloomy hypothesis, was that young people today aren't interested. You know, that they, they have their, their, you know, their tablets and their phones and their games consoles, which are very shiny and exciting and come in a nice box, and that that might have killed off the interest. What we actually discovered with the Pi, vast number of kids, if you can get them over that first t- five or ten minutes, just give them an intro to it, then they're away. And they, it, gives them a, it gives them a kind of secret knowledge often that the adults, are, you know, kids love having secret knowledge. You know, um, when I was a kid, it was being the person who could set the time on the video recorder. Kids love that stuff, and coding is a really fertile source of secret knowledge for kids. I feel very uneasy that what's been defined as computing has ended up being can I use Microsoft Word and Excel and that kind of stuff and the real bare bones of actually can I write computer programs has, has largely been overlooked and lost. Yeah, we, um, I think we had uh, 10 or 15 years of, um, of really teaching people the wrong stuff. The former unlamented uh, ICT curriculum in the UK was teaching children both things that they didn't find interesting. It was teaching them several times. We would meet a child who had been taught how to use PowerPoint every year between the ages of 6 and 18, right? Um, we'd somehow manage to turn computing, which could be about uh, writing games and, and building robots, we turned computing into what was regularly rated as the most boring subject at school. And so you're teaching these people things, you're boring them out of their minds, and the skills you're teaching them are not the high-value skills. They're not the skills that will enable them to go and get a high-value job. You're basically teaching them the outsourceable, offshoreable skills of typing. How much will a person who goes into the computer industry earn in a year now? It's quite high, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's one of the, uh, the best-paying professions. If you, if you choose to go into engineering, and we're not saying that everyone should, it is, I've been an engineer all my adult life. Um, my view is I've been paid for 20 years now to play with toys, you know, to basically play with Lego every day. So some people will go into that, which they'll find very rewarding. And some people will find that the skills that they've learned as a, by doing computer programming, we think coding makes you a better lawyer. It makes you a better doctor. Maybe it doesn't make you a better novelist, but pretty much everything that you might decide to go into as an adult, you'll benefit from that kind of mindset. Eben Upton, who is the founder of the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Thank you very much. And also joining us now is Sam Aaron. He's created a coding program that can be used with Raspberry Pi and most computers, in fact, to live code music. Now, we're going to be putting this program through its paces in a minute. But first, I wanted to ask you, what exactly is this? It's called Sonic Pi. What is it? I mean, we've just heard about how important it is to get people to code. In my opinion, it's not just about getting people to be professional programmers, but also use code to express themselves. In the same way we write and read, we write diaries, we write poems. We can also use code in the same way to express ourselves in really exciting new ways. And so Sonic Pi is software which allows you to write code, basic words, press a special magic button and hear amazing sounds. As a musician, I'm really excited by this and I know a lot of computer musicians, they're using programs like Ableton and things like that that cost hundreds and hundreds of pounds to make music and often I I play with them. So how is this different? Why did you make this? I mean, I, I downloaded it earlier for free. Absolutely. So you heard Eben earlier talking about lowering the barrier to entry. I mean, part of the deal about the Raspberry Pi is extremely affordable. And so the software I've written is also extremely affordable. It's entirely free. Um, and so the idea is, if you don't have any money, it doesn't matter. You can use this software. And also, it runs on all computers. So it runs on a Raspberry Pi, but also runs on a Windows or a Mac. So if you already have a computer, use that. But if you don't, then get one of these Raspberry Pis because they're really wicked fun. Now, is this just a way of basically tricking kids and tricking even adults? into doing a bit of coding or is it actually genuinely a musical tool could you make musical compositions that would stand up on this I mean is writing poetry tricking kids into grammar <laughs> right <laughs> clearly not right so, so this well, is not tricking bit. people into <laughs> writing code code is an amazing expressive form uh, and it's just shown people that potential and yes Sonic Pi is a new musical instrument that you can use today to perform in nightclubs and venues to make music, and it's a lot of fun. Right, and well, enough talking about it. Let's see it. So we've got a computer screen set up. We've got your little um, Raspberry Pi, sort of naked circuit board sitting there. And on the screen, I can see just some lines and lines and lines of code. They look like words, sleep, bit crusher, saw, sustain. What is this? So I'm showing you here one of the examples. So when you start up Sonic Pi, you have a help system Health system contains a bunch of examples. This is one of the pre-canned examples, just to show you what you can do with the system. So, should we should we hear it? Yeah, yeah, go on. Let's All play right, something. Let's give it right. a go. 
Right, so we're getting sort of like dance music here. This is all generated in uh, real time on the Raspberry Pi using lots of fancy mathematics to make the sounds. The synthesizers are all real time generated. So the, this little Raspberry Pi is an extremely capable machine. It's able to do this. So I use this same system to perform on stage in nightclubs. That is incredible. I mean, I kind of, you know, it's kind of pumping. We're all like, yeah, come on, hands in the air, people. <laughs> They're going wild. Reach for the lasers. Calm down, people, calm down. <laughs> Never thought I'd say that on the, uh, right. on the radio. So what have we got going on here? So it's making drums and synths and all these kind Absolutely. of things. Absolutely. So shall I get, show you how to get yeah, started? Let's, let's so have a go. Let's, do, let's make a tune. The Bang in the tune. Come on. <laughs> so the, the first word to learn in Sonic Pi is the word play. Because we're playing a note, but also playing. We're having fun, right? So I write the word play, and then I choose a number to play. Let's choose like 80. We hear a little beep, right? That's it. That's okay. your first program. How easy is that to write? Yeah, that, that was even I, I think. <laughs> right, <laughs> As a so kind of notes and paper steps. musician could do that. So once you, once you write your first program, the next thing is how do you change these things? So now we can change this number 80 because numbers can go up and down. Notes can also go up and down. So if I choose a no lower number, like 60, get a oh, lower note, Yeah, it's right? much lower. Or okay. 90, get a higher note. Right, so done. So now we can play all the notes we can imagine. Then we need a way to make a melody. Okay. So if I play note 60, then I need to have a way of saying, well, wait for a bit, so let's sleep for a second, and then play another note, play 65, say. And then let's sleep for half a second and play 72. So this way you're able to uh, play different notes and make a little melody, right? Oh, I like that. It's At this point, with these two commands, play and sleep, we can play pretty much all of Western notation. So if you take any Bach or Mozart or Beethoven with two commands, you can reproduce those things. It's not slamming beats yet, but we've already done classical music. <laughs> OK. <laughs> can we make it a bit more funky? Can we, yeah, uh, so can we get it kind of going? The next thing we need to do is we need to, once you've got play and sleep, we need some programming structures to help us to, to manipulate this stuff. So I've invented something called the live loop. And a live loop is just a thing which can loop, right? So let's play a, a sample... Loop Amen, which is an Amen Is that break. the Amen break? Yeah. Very well known. Sleep for the one length of that sample. That's what drum and bass is made of, fans. But now we've got this loop going around. OK, but whilst it's playing, I can now change the, the rate, say, to be half. And now we've got it at half, and I can bring it back up to one again. And I'm just changing one number here. Let's go reverse, minus one. Let's add some, uh, some bass. And then let's add some slicer to slice the volume in and out. So I just choose where to start the slicer and where to end it. And so just by adding a simple piece of code on top of another simple piece of code. I think we've got a number one hit here already. I mean, it's kind of, it's, it's fairly boring and repetitive, but, but uh, <laughs> there you go. Well, I mean, that's what dance music is. <laughs> exactly. You have to be able to dance to it, you know? So you say it's fairly boring and repetitive, but we've only got nine lines of code here. How long would it take someone like me to actually make a, a tune, a, a kind of a song with a beginning, a middle and end, some structure? It depends on how complicated your tune will be. I, I went to a school in Newcastle, Benton Park Primary School, where they have a Sonic Pi orchestra, and they've been teaching themselves, the kids have been teaching themselves, and the kids, the primary school kids, have been teaching their local teachers how to do this stuff. This is 10-year-olds, OK? So you just need some time and some creativity and some fun and some patience. In a few days, you can get the basics down, and then depending on how much time you want to put into it. In the same way, if you want to learn a violin, how much practice you put into it, you can get to do some wicked things pretty quickly. And is there transferable skills from learning to, uh, to write this kind of stuff? Absolutely. This, this system is written in the same language that Twitter was originally written in. Right? <laughs> That's Using boring exact... and repetitive. <laughs> Using exactly the same structures uh, as Twitter was originally written in. So you absolutely, and all the, the UK government work is all written in the same language. There's a language called Ruby. Uh, so, also boring and repetitive. Absolutely <laughs> transferable, yeah. Uh, but code is not boring. It, it can be repetitive, <laughs> but the computer does the repetition, not you. So we're going to have a little bit of time now. I want you to show me what you can do. Come right, on, okay, let's... Because uh, let's you, you play in nightclubs, don't you? you? You've played this stuff out and people do dance to it. Absolutely, yes. So let's choose one of the examples of the way to start. So this is an example called Tilburg. So this is going, so I've got my basic tune round. It's very hard to play with that. I can't fully hear myself. Normally, the beats are bashing out. <laughs> right, so I can turn the randomization off. I mean, I, I do like my house music, and this sounds pretty good. <laughs> it's nice, yeah. So I start and stop it. Sorry, I made a mistake. So you can make mistakes all the time. That's totally fine. Right, so turn off bits. Turn off the bass drum. And get the rhythm going again. 
and then drop the kick in again. And off we go. So all I'm doing there is editing some very simple lines to make that happen. So it's called Sonic Pie, and uh, people can go home and have a go. Thank you very much. That's Sam Aaron, computer scientist from Cambridge University. How much of your day is spent on a computer looking at your phone or doing something online? It's very easy to forget that just 60 years ago, none of this was possible. And by today's standards, the simplest calculations took weeks of combined work from lots of people. That is, until something called EDSAC came along. EDSAC stands for Electronic Delay Storage Automatic Calculator, probably why it's called EDSAC. It was built at Cambridge University shortly after the Second World War to start crunching through some of these complex maths problems in much less time and a thousand times faster than otherwise possible. It was the first computer built for other people to solve problems on. Today, virtually nothing of EDSAC survives, but now a team are attempting to rebuild a working replica to eventually put on display in the National Museum of Computing at Bletchley Park. Nigel Benet is a retired physicist who's building a section in his garage in Cambridge and Greer Jackson went to meet the man and the machine for a cup of tea and a trip through history. Yes, yes. Nice to meet you. I'm just going to make some tea. And would you like tea, coffee or something? Orange juice, water? I'd actually love an orange juice. I feel like a big kid. Yeah, 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 we have gin and tonic. (laughs) It's not Friday just yet. Immediately after the war, Morris Wilkes, he'd worked on radar. And in radar, they'd managed to get a a storage device where you could store the equivalent of 72 bytes in a five-foot tube full of mercury. I mean, that's not even a Word document, is it? (laughs) No, it's barely a character. You might get a tiny little icon out of it. So the biggest constraint to making a computer was where can we store it? EDSAC had the largest memory that existed. It had about half a tonne of mercury. And Which it, equates to how many bytes? 2,300 bytes. Still oh. doesn't sound that much. It, and that was the entire machine to hold all the programme and all the data that you were going to execute. It wasn't just important for terms of memory. My understanding is that lots of scientists were running lots of mathematical equations and women were taking months to do them. So it played a pretty fundamental role in science as well once it was built. Absolutely. EDSAC claimed three Nobel Prizes and the ladies you refer to were collectively as computers because they computed. They had to turn the handle calculator where you put the numbers on the thing, turn the handle. Very elegant but very, very slow. To put it in context, EDSAC runs at about 1,500 times faster than one of those ladies would do. Can we go and see it? Because I know you've got your own workshop dedicated to Um, replicating it. Yes, let's go and see it. What you can see here is about 25% of the EDSAT replica. Uh, There are three seven-foot-high steel racks painted a nasty yellow colour. That's because they were in a film, the imitation game. These three... Racks represent the actual calculator part of the computer. A lot of the rest of the machine is to do with memory. What I would describe what I'm looking at is what looks like a series of almost bookshelves. And on each shelf there is hundreds of metal tubes, sun-painted bright red, almost like a lipstick. And this is just all various instrumentation to do maths, like a modern-day calculator, what I might have on my phone. Absolutely. Take me through what would have happened back in the 1950s. I'm a scientist. I'd like to do, not my two times table, I'd like to do something a bit more sophisticated than that. How would it work if, if it was in its full glory here? So you were, I forget the two guys' names, I should do, they both won Nobel Prizes, but they were trying to work out how nerve pulses propagated through nerves. But their theory involved a complicated balance or imbalance of of chemicals going on. And these can be represented by differential equations. Okay, so I've got my equation now, and you didn't have a lovely keyboard. How would you translate that into EDSAC? You would type a paper tape. Sorry, paper tape. Right, let me show show you some five-hole paper tape. Right. This this little box here Mm -hmm. contains paper tape. That is program 17, and the date is 1968. Oh, my goodness. Okay, it's almost like Braille, but instead of being a bump, you've hole-punched it through. Yes. That goes into the computer, and then you'll have another tape where you've typed data in that you need to analyse. 
Yep. So that That's goes it. into the machine. The machine does some magical maths, I assume. Well, the, the, the maths actually isn't really so magical. It's all... The key thing about computers is they very rarely do anything complicated, but they do complicated things by doing simple instructions, lots of them. Given that lots of people are reconstructing EDSAC, mm -hmm. I wonder what happened to it in the first place? It was very unceremoniously dismantled and sold off with scrap metal. Some people did actually take them away as bookshelves. Someone at home has no, got no, not, not, EDSAC it, as their bookshelf. Why are you going about completely re reconstructing, reconstructing it? Before digital computers existed, there was no need to program them because no one had the concept. But once they existed, as Morris Wilkes said, now we've got EDSAC, now we need to learn how to use it. I had to program it. Well, that was the beginning of software, so that makes it very important. The second motive for it is the educational value. When school children come to the museum, beforehand they will be able to um, write programs for EDSAC. And when they come to the museum, it'll run their program, print out a result, and they can take that home with them. They will be programming at the nuts and bolts level of computing. And that's incredibly important. I think especially so since so many people are out of touch with... I mean, I certainly have no idea how my computer works, yet I rely on it yeah. day in, day out. You, you don't need to. You don't need to. And uh, in my view, is in the 21st century, computer literacy is as important as learning to read and write and do arithmetic. Greg Jackson speaking with Nigel Benet. You are listening to The Naked Scientist with me, Katani, and also with Chris Smith. In October this year, every 11-year-old across the UK is going to receive, via their school, a free gadget, and it's the micro bit. It's developed by a group of collaborating organisations. They're led by the BBC, but they include the Cambridge-based company Arm. Now, if you don't know who Arm are, I can see a number of people here have got mobile phones about their person. Well, Arm design 99% plus of the world's microchips that you see in those sorts of mobile devices. And Gary Atkinson and Tristan Hughes work for Arm. They're with us. And thanks to them, we're actually going to get a look at what this micro bit looks like and what it can do. Gary, hello. First of all, describe the micro bit for everyone at home. The micro bit is a very small pocket-sized computer, but it differs from the Raspberry Pi in that this is the sort of platform that you'd find in a, a smartwatch or a, a wearable type device, you know, an Internet of Things type device. It's sort of the, roughly the same size if I snapped my credit card in half, which I feel like doing, it, judging by the bill at the moment, um, it would be about that big. Yeah, it's about this, I'm showing my age talking about matchboxes, but it's about the size of a matchbox. So it's got a, an array of LEDs on the front, right? So you can have scrolling text, you can have little sprite-type designs. It's got a couple of programmable buttons on the front. Similarly to the Raspberry Pi, one of the things that kids really are interested in is the fact that this is not covered in a box. That you can actually see the different chips and the pieces. And so on the back of the micro bit, we describe where the Bluetooth low energy antenna is and where the um, USB chip is and, and where different pieces are. So they can actually have a look and see what things are called. Indeed, I mean, this is a, a PCB, printed circuit board, and I can see all of the tiny little tracks, which are the connections between the things. So what could I do with it? As it stands by itself uh, with, with a battery uh, power supply, there is a, uh, an accelerometer, so it knows when it's being moved. It has a magnetometer on board, so it knows what direction it's pointing in. Oh, like a compass. Like a, a digital compass. So you can create little games, you can scroll text, um, you can use it as a controller. Uh, it has Bluetooth low energy built into it, so you can connect it to your mobile phone. Uh, so it can pull data from the phone, like uh, GPS, for example, if you wanted a location-based algorithm to run or you could use it as a little hand hand controller for a game running on, a, on an android phone for example but critically it doesn't have a keyboard or anything like that so how do you get your programs or whatever you want to do with it into it in the first place you can either connect it via there's a micro usb port so you can connect it to a pc um, you can go to the microbit website and you can log in and you can choose your development environment from a simple gui type Platform like a graphical user interface oh, sorry. For, for those not in the know of this yes. tech speak, Gary. A graphical user interface, so like Scratch, called Blockly, or you can use JavaScript or Python or C++, depending on your preference or your confidence level. Uh, and that's all browser-based, so you can do that on a PC or a laptop uh, or a tablet or a mobile phone. 
But the difference here is once you've maybe done that via USB, you could also, because it talks Bluetooth to your tablet or phone, you could actually program it and we can flash this device over Bluetooth, so over the air. Um, so you could imagine kids on the bus sending messages to each other and then in real time changing that message and recoding the device. Sounds perfect for a naked scientist, something you can flash. Um, okay. Let's come over to Tristan Hughes, because you have got an intriguing setup here, Tristan. A giant watering can and a beautiful looking orchid in a pot. Yes, we have. So this is our automated plant watering system demonstration. So it's a very basic demonstration using the micro bit. So we've connected it up to a uh, moisture sensor that's currently sat in the um, plant. So that's telling us how moist the soil is around the plant. Um, we've also connected it up inside the watering can. We've got a small pump and that's also connected to the micro bit. So when the micro bit senses that the uh, soil is getting a bit dry on the plant, we can use that to turn the pump on and water the plant. Can, can we see it work? So we actually know that this really is actually doing what it says on the tin? We can. So if we remove the uh, moisture sensor out of the soil for the time being to pretend that it's um, gone really dry. So by moisture sensor... Oh, wow! You can probably hear this at home. <laughs> the watering can is issuing a big jet of water and it's filling the pot up. The moisture sensor is quite literally two bits of metal, so you're just detecting the, the ability for electricity to pass between the two. Yes, we are, yeah. So that just gives us an analogue um, voltage into the micro bit. Uh, and then when we code the micro bit, we can just say, is it higher than a certain voltage or lower? Uh, and that's how we're using to determine that, um, whether to turn the pump on and off. So if a child wanted to do that at home, how hard would it be? Uh, it's fairly simple. Um, you just connect the, the moisture sensor up to the micro bit using one of the um, inputs and across the bottom. Uh, and then the code is very simple um, using the tools that have been provided to enable um, this kind of application to be produced. So this goes back to what Eben was saying earlier. It's all about empowering kids to get hands-on and do something. Let me ask you then, um, Gary, why did you get into computing in the first place and then end up ultimately working for what, what is ostensibly one of the world's most important tech companies? Well, you know, similarly to Eben, I'm a, a child of the BBC Micro. Um, so when, when I was at secondary school, we had one in the classroom. Some people took to it very naturally. Um, some people didn't. I probably didn't, actually. But, you know, it was, we were all exposed to it. And that's similarly the rationale for what we're doing with the microbit is we're giving this to everybody, state school, private school, homeschooled, every year 11 child in, in October. You know, we wanted to be completely inclusive, didn't matter male or female, ethnicity, social background, you get one. And, you know, the goal is, you know, assuming that we can repeat this every year, that we maybe get another 100,000 engineers um, who are interested either in STEM or, um, uh, or ICT, but or just creatively using electronics to, to do something interesting. Let's hope it works, because as we said earlier, we need 1.4 million of them. So, Tristan, apart from watering plants, what else have you got dreamed up for this thing that people could conceive of doing with it? So we've also um, done a hoodie that uh, has LED stitching around the hood, but it uses the uh, Bluetooth Lenergy on the micro bit. Um, so you have a smartphone app and you can set the colour of the LEDs on the hood using that. And we're also thinking about different ways we can use the sensors on board the micro bit so you can create something just using the micro bit alone without having to connect any external sensors to it. Alarm for my bedroom, perhaps? Definitely, yes. <laughs> With maybe a method so it can text you, so you know that when someone's entered your room. Really? That could be quite cool. So how would you do that? Um, again, you could use the Bluetooth Lenergy on the, the micro bit to connect your mobile phone uh, and use that as a method of notifying you when something like that's happened. Someone's invading your bedroom. Well, we wish you luck with it. Thank you very much. So the launch is in October across the country, but it's being unveiled this week, Gary. Yeah, it was unveiled on Tuesday, just gone, uh, in London. Uh, the teachers will be getting theirs in September and then all the kids should be getting theirs in, theirs in October. Thank you very much from Arm, um, Tristan Hughes and you heard there, Gary Atkinson. Now, with current technology, the sky really is the limit and advances in software and downsized computer chips have allowed drones to really take off, if you'll excuse the pun. Drones are unmanned aerial vehicles which can be flown autonomously or via remote control from the ground. Drones are now so cheap to make and build that they can be owned by just about anyone. And with these fast little flying copters, a new sport has been born, drone racing. Georgia Mills went to see a man about a drone. Simon Vance Kalina is one of the founders of the London Aerospace Group and a drone pilot. Drones themselves, as a thing that you can buy, a consumer product, are only a few years old. But as mobile phone technology sort of made chips available that are fast and good accelerometers, that's made 
possible smaller and smaller drones. And at some point about two years ago, people realized that you could build these small carbon fiber drones with good quality lithium polymer batteries, and they were really, really fast. And then people just started racing them. And how did you get into racing? I saw a video on YouTube when I was snowboarding once and uh, it was somebody just like absolutely flying through the trees and it reminded me of sort of Star Wars, the the pod racing or like flying uh, speeders through the forest and I was like, I just have to do that. So I think I ordered all of the bits on that that first weekend and, and then built my first one. Uh, how do you go about building a drone? You watch a lot of YouTube videos. Everybody who flies drones at the moment also builds them. There aren't really any off the shelf ready to buy racing drones yet, although they're coming. Even if you buy one off the shelf, the first time you crash it, you're going to have to rebuild it. And crashing and rebuilding is part of the, the hobby or the part of the sport so far. And is there any element of, of software to it? The drones all have a little uh, computer chip called a, a flight controller. Uh, and that runs a, an algorithm called the PID loop. And there's a few different implementations of the PID loop. The one that we all fly is called Clean Flight, and it's built by a British programmer called Dominic Clifton. So yeah, you can, you can download the source code for this. They're all open source. If you know programming, if you know a little bit of C, you can download the source code and just hack on it and make it do what you want. And I see you've got some here laid out on this table. There are, there are a variety of sizes. All of them have four sticky-outy propellers on them. Can you tell me a bit about these guys? This is the Thug 180. It's made by um, Thug Frames. This one here I call the Nerd because it's kind of I designed it myself and it looks like it's got glasses on. <laughs> and the camera in the front of it is the Nerd Cam. The Nerd is the one that can see in 3D. I'm quite excited to see one of these in the air. Can we can we have sure. a go? Yep, let's do it. So you, you'll put these goggles on here. What are these goggles for? Uh, these receive the picture from the from the drone, so you see what the drone sees. Oh wow! So we get a drone's eye view of of the flight. Yep, exactly. And I see you've got a spare, so you're going to take me along for a ride? Yep, absolutely. So you'll see, you'll see uh, the same thing that I'm seeing. Oh, <laughs> that's so weird. So I can see myself through the nerd vision, as it Do were, your, um, with the goggles. So what right. it is, I'm going to fly for you now, and you can just uh, sit back and enjoy the, the 3D vision. <laughs> So we're just hovering in the air now, taking a look at, <laughs> it's looking at Simon as he's got the controller and going really low. You can see almost the, each blade of grass <laughs> coming towards you. This is <laughs> quite frightening. I wouldn't recommend doing this on an empty stomach, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> can I trust that you're not going to fly this thing into me? <laughs> oh, it's coming very close. <laughs> almost felt the breeze there <laughs> as it flew past. <laughs> really picking up speed now, zooming along along the ground. And oh, oh no, I got a 3D crash. Let's go and see if it's okay. Is it all right? <laughs> it's we robust. And roll. <laughs> so your avatar's got nothing on this. It's great, isn't it? A live 3D drone crash, it's amazing. Yeah. When is drone racing going to be in the Olympics? Oh, soon, I hope. I, it's so much fun. There's so many leagues starting up. There's a big one in the US called the Drone Nationals, which is bringing together the best pilots in the world. And, and it's an amazing spectator sport too because everybody brings their goggles and everybody watches everybody else's race from the first person. So it's like, you know, imagine going to the Formula One races, but everybody can see the view from the driver's cockpit the whole time. So it's, it's yeah, it's really fun. Is it all fun and games with these drones? Is there any other applications people have been looking into? We know people that are putting infrared cameras on drones to do search and rescue. So if there was somebody, you know, a hiker lost in the forest, Amazon's talking about using drones to do deliveries. I personally can't see how that's going to work. I don't think it's going to work in London. It's very hard to find somewhere you can safely drop a package off in London. Is there any chance that people could hack into drones? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I saw a tweet the other day that one day we'll see a, a news drone chasing a police drone that's chasing a pirate drone that ripped off an Amazon drone. Like, we use frequency hopping and encrypted radio already so that we don't have to worry about people taking over our drones, but our video signals are still analog. Like, when we're flying, anybody can pick up our video signals. I was in very competent hands when we flew around, but say, I don't know, someone had had a bit to drink when they are flying them. Yeah, don't nothing. drink a drone. <laughs> that's one of the rules. <laughs> Well, there's nothing to stop a, a nefarious or drunk person flying into someone or even just spying through someone's window. People always say, like, you know, aren't you worried about people using drones to spy on people? Like, n my drones have never snuck up on anybody. They're so loud and they're so obviously in the air. And there's a great device that's been invented that protects people from being spied on by drones. It's called curtains. So, yeah, I don't think that's a real issue. I think they, being hit on the head by a, a half kilo flying brick with spinning blades on the front is more, more of, a, of an issue than, uh, than being spied on by something that's really, really loud and obvious.
like there are there are risks to them and it's a pretty unregulated industry or pretty unregulated hobby right now and everybody's very very careful to make sure that we only do it safely and stuff but like society is going to have to adapt so can you program a drone yeah so there's a there's a piece of software called nodecopter which is lets you um, send commands to the drone using the same programming language they use on the web so if you know javascript you can basically program a node copter to take off hover turn right turn left uh, it doesn't give it the sort of machine vision um, obstacle avoidance or waypointing or anything like that but for just like really basic uh, controls you can you can have a computer control a drone really easily i saw a video on youtube of someone i think they'd coded it to follow red and someone was running around with a red red flag and the drone was chasing them. Is, is, that, is that possible? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But the thing is, the image recognition stuff, you have to send the video back to a computer at the moment. Like, as computers get faster, we're hoping to move more and more of those smart algorithms onto the onto the microprocessor on the uh, on the drone, um, which might, will make them a lot more autonomous. If Moore's law keeps, keeps holding and, and microprocessors get faster, we'll be able to move all sorts of interesting algorithms onto the drone. And, like, all of those crazy things, like like image recognition and you know face recognition and like following a particular car and all of that stuff will be able to be done on the drone once once the processes are fast enough that was georgia mills and simon van scalina flying or perhaps crashing their drones around london you are listening to the naked scientists with me katani and also with chris smith and we're looking at the digital age we live in now, we've heard about how people are using coding to set booby traps on their bedrooms or perhaps water their plants and a whole host of other ideas. But what about when industries choose to make it digital? In October last year, Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge became the UK's first healthcare institution to become an e-hospital and to transfer its patient records from online paper copies to online records, which meant staff can now access records even on mobile devices around the hospital and possibly even from home when they're on call. Lydia Drumwright's lecturer in clinical informatics at Addenbrooke's Hospital. Hello, Lydia. So why has Addenbrooke's decided to make this investment? It's been expensive. Yes, Chris, but it's about universal, high-quality care for all, and that's really the focus that Enbrooks Hospital has. What does actually making an e-hospital, an electronic hospital, involve? So what it involves is taking what we used to see as um, paper records, and we had paper records and electronic systems, as you well know. In the laboratory, we had electronic systems, then we had a bit of paper, and everyone had to go on different systems. This is about taking all the paper, all the electronic systems, and universalizing them into one. So what that means is that when you're the medical doctor, as you well know, um, for a given, any given patient at any given time of the day, you have 100% of their medical information up to date right in front of you when you need it. It sounds pretty simple, though, because, I mean, I, to be fair, I can do online banking from anywhere in the world. I can move some money around on some bank accounts. Why is this a challenge when it comes to health? There are a number of reasons that it's challenged. The first being, if you haven't done it before, um, we, we took everything that every doctor, nurse and other care provider knew in the hospital and changed it on them overnight. They had to change the way they worked and the way they operated. That being said, they're working very well with it now and very pleased with it for the most part. Where will this return benefits in healthcare? So what we've done as part of um, Cambridge University Hospitals Foundation Trust is combine this with research, and that's always been the plan from the beginning. CUH has the opportunity and the relationship with the University of Cambridge to do this and be the cutting edge so we can deliver high-quality translational research. And I think you and I were having a discussion before talking about just some of the things that can happen. And out in Stanford, they talked about um, really important items where when a drug goes out to market, we think it's safe, we've tried it out, but we don't know until it's been out on the market for 10, 20 years, and we don't know what the side effects will be. But we can monitor those when we are um, using an electronic medical record system. Is that because rather than having to pay a human to relentlessly plough through many, many, many hospital notes, read appalling handwriting and try to work out what is wrong with a patient, what's happened to a patient, what drugs they've been taking, and all that takes time. You could write a computer programme which would do that very, very quickly on a massive scale. 
Absolutely. Our team is doing that now at Cambridge University Hospital. And you can also, uh, knowing about reading medical notes, just to go back to that and patient safety, I've been through many, many of them in my career as a researcher. And I think it's hard for uh, ourselves or even other doctors to read another doctor's handwriting in the notes. Everything's clear with a... It's intentional, Lydia. (laughs) I can't comment on that, Chris. Maybe you can. So what what you're saying is that because we can marshal lots of data from lots of people very quickly, A, we can make new discoveries about how drugs work, about how drugs work even better under certain circumstances, but equally we can make things safer because we can find out when things don't work so well because we can link up and look at lots and lots of people and you've got to look at lots of people to get lots of data to find out what these differences are. Absolutely. There are a lot of other things that we can do as well. So my team is looking at putting in interventions in that support medical staff to help them make a system safer. Um, We are looking at uh, the epidemiology of people. If we can connect up all the medical records in um, a country like the UK with the NHS, what we can do is actually look from birth to death at what the risk factors are for each and every individual problem. What about the one thing that people often do highlight with medical records uh, and their personal data, the safety of that data, the integrity of that data, making sure it doesn't get hacked, for example? I think that's a really important question, and I think it's really important to share um, how we do that. And the first being that in the UK, um, we have two data centres that are to the highest NHS standards dedicated to hold this information. It is not accessible on the internet, as you well know, maybe being a doctor trying to look it up on call. Yeah, allegedly, I can access this from home, and I've tried, and it told me I wasn't allowed. That's because you're not quite fitting into the security system. If you go talk to IT, they'll help you out with that. But That's, that's kind very... of a good test, I suppose. If, if its own staff can't get in, that's kind of proving that the data is secure, isn't it? Well, I think we want the doctors to have access to the data. But the other thing that I, I should highlight is that Epic, which is the system that we bought, has been running for over 20 years in the U.S., in multiple systems and around the world, and there has never been an external breach of the system. So I think people should feel quite secure in that. If they don't, then I can tell you what the data look like on the back end. There's no nice spreadsheet where Mrs. Smith and all the details next to it. Uh, Connecting that up takes a lot of computer programming. And as you well know, on the front end, in order to get in, you have to have a medical login, which we can monitor and we can see everything you're doing, not to scare you, Chris. And uh, then you have to have specific details about the patient, such as their medical record number, their birth date. You can't just look people up by their name. And you say that uh, this is the first time this has been done in the UK, which is a big step forward for the UK, but compared with other countries, how do we fare? Compared with most high-income countries, we are a bit behind in terms of getting medical records electronic and out there, and that's because it's been recognised as an opportunity for high-quality patient care and safety. And so what we are trying to do now and what the Department of Health has called for is sometime between 2018 and 2020 to have all medical systems on an electronic medical record. Lydia, thank you very much. That's Lydia Drumwright. She's from Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge University. Thank you. Now, data doesn't have to be intimate details about your health. It could be as simple as your clicking or shopping habits online, which get updated every time you surf the web. But how is this data used and just who is using it? We're joined now by Richard Mortier. He works for the Computer Laboratory at the University of Cambridge, and he's been peering behind this curtain of digital tracking. Hi, Richard. Hi. Tell me, I, I'm someone I love going online. I'm doing like my Facebook, my Twitter, my Ocado shop because I'm middle class. Uh, all this kind of thing. When is my behaviour being tracked? What sort of data are people tracking? So a very common case, for example, is as you're just as you're browsing websites, uh, you'll find that most websites, when you pull them to your browser and the browser shows them to you, are running pieces of code in the background. And those pieces of code are pulling other information in from other websites to show you advertising, uh, maybe to send back analytics and statistics about who's doing things. And as you start to stitch together the some of the sites that you visit, um, they'll be using many of the same ad tracking networks and the same systems and so some of these systems are able to start uh, stitching together a picture of where you visited on the web and what your interests are as a result. I think the concern is not so much that advertising is a bad thing because clearly it can be a good thing although it can have uh, surprising side effects so there's a well-known case of 
I think, a teenager in America who was sent some advertising material from a supermarket chain called Target, and the material was to do with items that they wished her to buy that was to do with being pregnant. And her father didn't know she was pregnant, and so gave the supermarket manager apparently an earful about it and had to apologise a few days later because it turned out that she was. So it became something of a, as a surprise to them. So it's even, even with it just simple advertising, it can sometimes be surprising what behaviour is revealed through this. And it's often revealed in a way that you can't control and you don't anticipate, you don't understand. I mean, that's my next question. When I go online, say if people are going, OK, you've bought this, you've got that, it looks like you're going on holiday to Bradford, which is where I'm going soon. How long is this information stored for and what sort of companies are we talking about storing it? I think that's part of the problem is that it's not entirely clear to the people who the, who the information concerns. So information is typically going to be stored for a very long time. There's some evidence that, for example, you know, Facebook started showing you things in your timeline from several years previously. And in many people's cases, this came as an unwelcome surprise. You know, they saw evidence of relationships that are long since it's finished, for example. It can be stored for a long time and it can be shared and used in ways that are not always made obvious to you. We're going to have a quick look at a website now. Now, I mean, what, what sort of things are we talking about here? Is there any way to find out who is looking at my data? Let's have a look. What we've got here, we've got a newspaper website. So, yeah, so in this web browser, I've installed a couple of plugins that allow you to see some of, this, uh, some of these transactions taking place. Um, so if, for example, I reload this, uh, this web page, this is a popular Sunday newspaper. We'll Other see... popular Sunday newspapers are available. Indeed. We'll see some information popping up shortly on the right-hand side of the screen. So you can see the number of sites that are being blocked here. Whoa, 36, um, 38, 30... I think now, 47, 60. So there's many, many sites being contacted as a result of having loaded just this front page of this particular website. OK, this is just one page of a website, and there's now we're up to, like, uh, yeah, 60 websites. Are these all just advertisers, just, you know, trying to get hold of my data? Some of them will be advertising, some will be analytics, some might be, yeah, I can see uh, there's a Facebook uh, site in there, there's a Google page in there. So there's a variety of different companies that are being contacted, none of which was necessarily obvious to anybody just visiting this page. And I've not heard of most of those companies. I, how can I stop them finding out about my stuff? I don't want I, all these unpronounceable companies looking at my data. Um, so you can do that by installing some... You, commonly you install things into browsers or you use private browsing modes and so on. It can become a little bit intrusive because you start to find that bits of the experience you expect on the web stop working when you start blocking all of this, for example. Another one, a plugin that's showing here, is showing the linkages between some of these advertising sites. So the fact that you go to two completely separate websites there. You visited two sites, it's telling me that it's been connected with 108 other sites as a result. And some of those sites are shared between the two sites I actually visited. So you can start to see some of the linkages that are created in this ecosystem. Now, that could be concerning if you don't really want one website to know what another website thinks of you. For example, yeah. I think it, it gets even worse when you start to throw other things in the mix. So some of the, um, the ability, for example, of Google with all the Gmail accounts that people have to scan the contents of your email and see some of that. If you're sending your Ocado shopping online shopping receipts to a Gmail account, then all that information is in there as well. So there's a lot of information that you put out out there. Um, and without necessarily understanding the implications of all these different companies having access to some of it or being able to pull it together in different ways. And is there anything that people can do? You've mentioned some blockers and things like that. If you don't want people to, uh, to see what you're up to online or track your data... Um, I think, well, there are certainly blockers out there that you can install into a number of the, the common browsers. Um, I know some people have some colleagues, for example, who go to the extent of not having mobile phones so they can't be tracked because they believe that's too... Well, that's their excuse. But that's, this is a, so there's, a, there's clearly there's a spectrum of responses you can have to this. Um, some people just don't care. Right? Um, you know, maybe they, they don't see the need to. I think that the key thing here is to get the sort of understanding and start to see some of this revealed a bit more so we can understand it and respond to it more appropriately. I was going to say, is there any kind of regulation of this? You know, 108 third-party websites have seen the two sites that we've just taken a look at. Does anyone know about that? Is anyone overseeing this? I assume they're not just UK sites. No, there, there is regulation that applies to this. Uh, it's not an area I'm particularly expert in, but certainly the European Union and the Data Protection Act, for example, that has been applied in the UK as a result of the legislation in the EU, tries to control how some of this information has to be treated, what can be done to it, what can't be done to it. But there's a constant sort of evolution here where the technology moves quickly and lawmakers try and, try and keep up with it, essentially. So I think it's, it's quite an active area at the moment. It's quite evolving quite quickly. And very briefly, what do you see as the future of this? I mean, in a, in a good light. I think that it's about giving people, the people who want to, the knobs that they can turn in order to control this experience and allowing people to share what they 
what they want to share and not to share what they don't want to share. At the moment, it's just happening outside of your control, essentially, and so it's, there's really there's too much going on without you being aware of it. Ideally, it would be up to you to make decisions about what you wanted to have happen here. And if that meant that you, wanted, you didn't care and you wanted everybody to see everything you did, that would be fine. And if it meant that you wanted to hide everything, that would be okay too. Thank you very much. That's Richard Mortier. Now, while you might not want some targeted adverts because this is a bit of a nuisance, what about your bank details? Would you want someone to know those? You might think, for instance, that your home internet's very secure, but have you been connecting to Wi-Fi lately? And if so, well, you might want to take extra care to look at exactly who you are connecting to. James Lyon is the head of the security division at uh, Sophos, which is a digital security company, and he's been very busy looking at the Wi-Fi habits of the public, haven't you, James? Oh, yes, and uh, they are rather concerning, I have to say. We're all a bit addicted to Wi-Fi, unfortunately. Tell us about this project that you ran, because you're holding some gadgetry, and that's the thing with the giant aerial. I presume that's a little mobile hotspot. Yeah, that's correct. So th- there's a myriad of, of different attacks that occur on wireless networks, but the one that we were most interested in was really people's natural behaviours, their level of trust when just connecting to a wireless network. So we set up eight or nine different wireless networks, and for a period of two hours, walked around offering people free Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi where they had to register, and in some cases, Wi-Fi where they had to pay. Where? Now, this was actually in, in New York City, uh, and I have to say my, my most active Y fishing area, as we've dubbed it, was the airport. Uh, it seems like people get off planes and are very hungry for wireless to check their emails. And in just under two hours, we were able to snare 109 people into handing over their credit card details to a company that had as much trust as, well, anyone on the internet. I mean, I bought the logo from a clip art site for about five US dollars. The domain name cost another 15. And I bought a, an SSL certificate, which gives you that little padlock that we're all trained to trust. That was about 50 US dollars, so a, a high trust operation. So let's just explain what you mean by this. You went to the airport or some places around New York. You set up well, like a Wi-Fi offering. Connect to me, I'm offering you Wi-Fi. And, and it would allow people to connect to it to gain internet access, and it even offered them a trustworthy-looking padlock so they thought they were doing secure internet browsing. That's perfectly correct. And we, we even actually went to the trouble of putting up a, an end-user license agreement. You know when you go to a, a coffee shop and it pops up and says, would you like to get online? You've got that little agreement, you have to scroll down. And, and what was really fun was in the agreement on paragraph two, it says, you know, this is a Sophos research project. You agree we can monitor your system entirely, log all of your data, and that we may contact you in the future to figure out why you did something so stupid. And no one reads it because the average time to click agree was 1.3 seconds. Um, So they all agreed and they connected to your hotspot and invisibly to them, what, you were sitting there like the man in the middle, listening or effectively eavesdropping on everything that they did online. Well, well, exactly. So here's the thing. When you connect to a wireless network, you hand over authority of where your computer is going to go on the internet to that network. In my case, the malicious attacker. So if you ask for a a resource, you know, like that, that nice news page we were just looking at, It's very easy for me to redirect you off to a nasty copy that asks for information uh, or maybe delivers some nasty malicious code that gives me more access to your computer. And there are some mitigating technologies and practices to this, but less than 1% of the people connecting actually took those. Didn't you do something like call it do not connect to me or something? And people even didn't fall for that. They, they, they still connected to it. Yeah, that was one of my personal favourites. Uh, get online and free public Wi-Fi were very popular. But in capitals, do not connect uh, saw 27 visitors. And I, I envisage these people sitting in coffee shops going, challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> and, w- and when they did connect, what did they do? So uh, a mass of different things. Um, social media updates uh, were, were, of course, very popular. We did see a little bit of internet banking. The good news is most of that was actually encrypted by default, so we couldn't poke inside it. Um, There are a few kind of nastier techniques we could have used, but we're obviously doing this ethically. Of course, all the other websites they visited, and there was lots of, in some cases, very strange web browsing. Um, I'm looking forward to releasing that list at some point. Is this in New York or elsewhere? (laughs) This was in New York, uh, although I have to say we... We have done uh, a series of Wi-Fi experiments in other locations, and so far Las Vegas has been the one that's caused the most sleepless nights. And um, when you go through that list, of course, any of those sites could be, unencrypted sites could be targeted. And once you've been compromised, 
your banking details are no longer safe. So it only takes one kind of weak point in the chain to get you infected. In other words, people connect trusting your connection, but you could be inserting data onto their computer that then compromises their computer so that next time they do online banking, regardless of whether it's got a secure connection to the bank, it's still sending you all the data in the meantime. Precisely, and the, and the nasty bit of this experiment that would have been trivial to do, but we stopped short of for, for ethics purposes, was to download that malicious code, at which point you can not only access internet banking, um, you can access the webcam, you can record from the microphone, and consider, I mean, there were a large number of laptops, there are smartphones there too. I mean, there are over 1.6 million malicious applications for Android devices now, and you know, I challenge listeners to think about a time where they don't have their phone next to them now they're making waterproof devices, that's getting even slimmer, and how compromising that could be to you. I mean, we are handing over the keys to our physical lives to cyber criminals in the digital world. And you can just plant data onto these devices and then basically you own them. Well, the, the good news is if you follow some fairly simple practices, it makes it a lot harder for cyber criminals. As I say, unfortunately, most people not doing that, but little things like keeping your software up to date, making sure you update your browser, you know, running good endpoint security controls, Although, best of all, if you're out and about, don't connect to a wireless network unless you really know who it belongs to. Maybe consider using data on your phone, which is much, much harder to intercept. You could easily envisage a scenario where people would come to an event like this one where they see big brands knocking around. So you could be perched on the edge of a big brand's tent or something and you could issue a, a Wi-Fi hotspot so people think, oh, that belongs to that big brand. They're trustworthy and, in fact, it's you. Yeah, I mean, the, the only indicator of trust you have when you first connect to a wireless network is the name. And, and you can set that to anything you want. Now, for, uh, for legal reasons, I mean, lawyers spoiling all my fun, I wasn't allowed to steal other people's brands. Apparently, that's you know, passing off or something like that. And um, so I was only able to use these generic names. But 2,000 people connected, five over, 500 of them just over, handed over email addresses and passwords, 109 credit cards. Imagine if I was to park up in a, a coffee shop or outside a, even a, 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 an enterprise and set up a network with the same name as their employee network. How many people could potentially have been snared? Scary stuff. We've got way too used to this protocol of connecting to any wireless network that professes to offer free Wi-Fi based on some text that anyone can enter. We've got a couple of minutes left, so let's just explore one other thing, which is getting to be big business. This is the Internet of Things. Mm. Now, you're saying let's keep our devices all up to date, but we're all dependent on third-party devices, which really probably have quite shoddy security, so we can't really do that. Yeah, that's, that's been another one of my recent research projects, uh, another one with lots of lawyers involved telling me what I shouldn't do. Um, <laughs> I've been following the rules. So, uh, actually, I, I've got a little case here with me, which is packed with uh, various Internet of Things devices. So I went on to Amazon and we bought about £5,000 worth uh, of CCTV cameras, various other bits and pieces, and went through them to find out how many of them had critical security vulnerabilities. Long story short, all of them did except for one, which actually was so poorly implemented we couldn't access it, which is what I like to call security through, well, essentially obscurity and unintelligence. <laughs> so I suppose if you buy something that's a reasonable price, there might be some security in the cost. Thank you very much. That's James Line. He is from Sophos, the online security company. So the bottom line is do not connect to a Wi-Fi hotspot if you don't know who's providing it. I think that's probably the best advice, isn't it, James? Thank you very much. Kat. Thank you to all of our guests this week. That's Eben Upton, Sam Aaron, Gary Atkinson, Tristan Hughes, Simon Van. Franz Kalina, Lydia Drumright and Richard Mortier. Thanks also to Georgia Mills for production. Next week, join us when we'll be investigating the mysterious millennium maths problem. Please do join us. The Naked Scientist comes to you from Cambridge University and it's supported by the STFC, the EPSLC and Rolls-Royce. I'm Chris Smith and thank you very much for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>